Hello and welcome back to 1979 and really they're getting to back towards the start of the arcade. We're getting back to the birth of the arcade because really the 70s was where it all began and we're certainly way over a decade. We're a good way over a decade from the last few games. We've been we've been in the 90s recently. And I suppose some of the late 80s, but we've definitely gone a good 10 years back. And two years after I was born, I've been, I was two years old when this game, game came out. And you see, first <laughs> we see the great stories that were written by these arcade machines. We are the Galaxians, Mission Destroy Aliens. The narrative, the narrative with these games was something quite stupendous. <laughs> um, I never actually played this in the arcades. I had an Acorn Electron at home though in the mid 80s and a copy called, it wasn't called Galaxians, it was, I think it must have been a bootleg and it was called Arcadians. <laughs> and oh, so here we go, we've got a little demo of what we can expect from the game going on. And the reason we've come back here and the reason I showed Asterix again the clips from Asterix is that after I finished recording the last video, I went back and I wanted to get to, I wanted to get to the end of Asterix and just see, because I criticised over the lack of variety of enemies and enemy sprites. And I wanted to see if there was much variety beyond those three legionnaires. And I couldn't get again past level two because no matter how many credits I had in the machine, You, it seems that you could only die a certain t number of times. You had only a number of lives before the game said, nope, you're going back to the beginning. And this seems like such a throwback because at this point, all the games I played were very much narrative driven. And no matter how many times you died, as long as you put money in the machine, you could always start back where you left off. And which was realistically the only way you could really progress through these games I'd spoken about. I'd spoken in the other videos about the difficulty levels and uh, yeah, and the Arabian fight video wasn't it, Arabian magic, just how, how the games persuade the player to part with their hard earned cash. But back here it was a bit different because here we go. This is how video games used to be. <laughs> A single screen and a single set of action really there was no variety really with the game because I mean it was largely limited by technology of the time I must say where I am sitting right now I cannot see the bullets <laughs> being dropped by these Galaxians but so I'm probably gonna die a bit more than I should anyway video games were I think close to, they were close to sort of like sports, you know, like a game of football or a game of tennis. Um, which is, they're a very simple set of rules, simple set of actions, repeated ad infinitum until you lose, and then the scores are totted up. And that is it, simplicity itself, isn't it? It was what mattered was the human versus the machine and very simple graphics and it was really a test really just a test of reflexes and skill with a series of very simple tasks so in this game move left move right shoot at the right time um, and as soon as all your lives run out no matter how many credits you've got left you still the score is reset to zero and you're back at stage one again. And that was the objective. That's what kept you hooked until you ran out of money or decided you were going to go back to the bar for another pint. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just a test of skill. There was no narrative to keep you going. These waves of aliens would go on forever and ever. So there was no story. Um, you never would destroy, defeat the alien armada and save the Earth. It was just about, here we go, 
I'll put another got two credits left, but game over. I press start and here we go. Score reset to zero. And you're back again and you got beat your high score. That is it. And that's how the game extracted the money from you. It was simply, can I beat my high score? Oh, back when days in games were simpler. So, but where did we go on from there? Let's skip ahead. And skip ahead we have two years to 1981 and another game that I had a bootleg version of on my Acorn Electron, Killer Gorilla it was called, but this is Donkey Kong. Um, and we've lost some of the, sp the sounds. How high can you try? So there you go, our challenge to the game player and, but what's more important now, I've chosen this because back when games were just Pac-Man and Pac-Man was the closest approximation to a human character, but what happens now? This is one of the earliest games I can remember where it wasn't the first obviously, but where you've got a representation of a human character. And that makes a lot of difference because not only have you got a human main character, as you can see, you've got a villain, you've got the you've got Kong up there, and you've got the heroine or the victim. <laughs> she suppose she's not really she doesn't do much. She's not exactly um it's hardly female empowerment here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got the setup for a narrative here, haven't you? We've got the hero, we've got the villain, and we've got the antagonist. So we've actually got the framework for a story. And that's really important at this point. Why is it important? Well, because as soon as we've got the framework for a narrative, people start making their own stories up and they just start thinking about stories and about how these stories work and they get invested in it and suddenly we've not only got the galaxians beat your high score get as far as you well kill as many aliens as possible we've now got human interest we've got can we rescue the girl and as well so we've got um yeah we've got a sort of kind of an emotional investment in the game now and we've got a villain that keeps stealing our victory away from us so here we go got more so and this is how the game's getting its money out of us now <laughs> this is how it sustains interest because that is the point of the coin op to keep interest in this game sustained so that the player keeps on putting more and more coins into the machine because now ooh, I'm gonna can I complete this I've got much further much quicker and I think I've played this a few times over the days um, this is can be fiendishly difficult this game I have to say now I know I can't make that jump I have to go all the way down here yes yeah, so the game does a lot to keep the player's interest in that sense, um, because we are being offered we are, we are being offered a specific story-based challenge, and we've got someone that we want to defeat. We want oh, damn, got the timing wrong. We've got we've got an enemy that we really want to beat, and we've got a story we want to progress through. But as we will see when I inevitably lose my final life on this, once I die here, once all my credits has gone, even though I've got, I'm putting money into this, there's no credit um, mark up on the screen. But once I die, it's right back to level one. And so you've got, it's basically structured exactly like that Asterix game, isn't it? damage controls <laughs> here we go so say game over I can't even though I know I've got more than one credit in here that's it I can't I can't carry on so it's right back to the beginning but it's 
see I've got seven credits I keep on hitting that select button um, it's not insurmountable to get back to where you go so it is it's still the test of skill but the player is now so yeah again but how high can you try it's giving the game is giving you an explicit challenge and if this so you've got the game challenging you and if you're in the arcade with your mates then they might be, you might be challenging each other to see who can get the furthest so all sort of psycho very psychological tactics to extract money from the player and that's what this is about that's what this is it's 90 percent psychological there you go because now i'm I'm going to want to see how far I can get in this game. How high can I try? The game also, though, this is a game that it's worth noting that introduces, as I, what killed me there, the difficulty spike. <laughs> and now you see, we're encountering more and more gameplay tropes that we're f familiar with, that, that can, modern gamers will be familiar with, the difficulty spike. And that had... That wasn't, the difficulty spike wasn't like a, supposed to be a fun element. It was developed as a monetization thing. I know monetization is a dirty word these days, especially when you were to think about Activision and Ubisoft and EA. Monetization and mobile games. Oh God, don't get me started on mobile games. But <laughs> how did I do that? I forget which one's the jump button. Um, Monetization. These, this is, this video games were originally built around monetization. What else is a coin op, but a, a big, floor floor standing monetization machine. That's all it was. It was there to extract money from you. So, monetization hasn't begun with microtransactions and mobile gaming and Candy Crush. It's begun with our favourite coin ops, and those tropes have stayed with. It. That was close. Uh, these those tropes have stayed with us so the difficulty spike the difficulty spikes on this each level has got a different difficulty type of difficulty spike so level two you're dealing with a new behavior in terms of the conveyor belts which killed me level three your difficulty spike is managing the timed jumps um all of which will kill the new player send you right back to the beginning so that you put more money in and of course make your way back to the level where you finally died to give it all another go with where you'll be far better armed because oh, can't snatch them far better armed to know what you're doing see i made a obvious mistake there but I'll learn now not to do that again. But I wouldn't have known. I thought I could quickly walk onto that and back again and not be killed by it. I've learnt my lesson now. You've got to cross all the way over them. Um, but yeah, difficulty spike. It's add unlike Galaxians, I keep on thinking of calling it Arcadians, it's adding in an entirely new gameplay mechanic into things to frustrate and confuse the player. But this game has certainly got a... It, it's a, unlike Asterix, with just four levels to it, this game has just got enough simplicity to it to make it not quite so frustrating to send you back to the beginning, but it's still keeping the challenge there. So I don't feel like really annoyed it's not like i went through half an hour's worth of gameplay to get where i went to then i'm shoved right back to the beginning of the game no it's i lose maybe five minutes of my time and i'm pretty sure i could get back to where i was in one or two in one credit so that's maybe 10p i've lost <laughs> back then i think this probably be 5p ago i think back in those days was it back when I could put one and two pence pieces into a coin op? Anyway, um, yeah, so difficulty spikes, a modern gameplay trope that's still there. Um, but should that trope be there in a game that isn't 
microtransactions. These are these are games with microtransactions. Each time you want to play them, this is the culling too. That people. <laughs> Every time you play it, you put money into it. So the difficulty spike is the original, one of the original microtransaction um, things. Like, like when you reach a point in a mobile game where it says either wait 24 hours before you can do the thing or pay us some crystals and we'll skip the wait. But we don't criticise Donkey Kong for being excessively microtransactioned, but, but I'm afraid it was. Um, so let's move on to my third example and yeah, let's think of a good game to use it for. I know what I'm going to do. So fast forward to 1987 and R-Type, classic shooter. Now R-Type builds on the last two games. So we had Galax Galaxians, which was... A very basic shooter, simple mechanics, um, no little no, no variety really, and no. Um, what do you call it? Ah, I'm losing my words here. No real progression in terms of gameplay. Um, there's no sort of acceleration of difficulty. But art, and then we move on to um, Donkey Kong, which that ha introduces difficulty spikes into video games. And so we have the game, the player, being thrown into a situation that they haven't encountered before, and they've got to make make do with very quickly getting used to um, new gameplay techniques. Including different different kind of platforming mechanics and so forth and so forth. Now we have our type. So we're five years on from Donkey Kong. Five or six six years on, I think. Yeah. And as we can see, is now we've got a much more gener generous continue system. For example, so do you see there? We weren't. We're not being reset. We we now have checkpoints. We're not sent right back to the beginning of the level. And as we'll see when I do finally die, because, yeah, here we go, game over. It's going to offer me... Do, 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 do. Continue, the continue screen. Which puts me back at that checkpoint. So I'm not forced back to the beginning of the game, even when the whole all the lives in the credit are out. So there we go. We now have games that are long enough to be... To require this to avoid becoming frustration frustrating because the game designers know that you can't annoy a player too much you can't say you can't you you you've got you can't frustrate a player too much you've got to throw them a bone and oh there we go i don't want to die at that point but i could have done because that is a mini boss. And we'll talk about those in a second. <laughs> Maybe I'll talk about it again. Have I got to fight that thing again or have I have I bypassed it? No, I haven't bypassed it. So we have the we now have it's sort of community cumulative. What's the, what's the word? I've discovered speaking and playing video games at the same time is is tricky. <laughs> But you can excuse me, can't you? Um, hang on, let's get through this. Oh, I hate that missile guy. Um, so these, the games keep on adding elements. So now we have the mini boss. Now bosses are the next stage of the difficulty spike. So we have games that, that that confuse the player by giving you new enemies that they're not expecting, um, different attack patterns, and we've got games that inspire the player to keep on going because 
Now at this point, games are sophisticated enough and there's enough memory to, to be able to have games that span lots of different levels with lots of different content. Do you remember like I was talking about Altered Beast back in the Altered Beast video? Um, in that the game shows the player just how much variety there is in it to inspire them to progress further than just the first level. You know, once you can continue in a game, you've got to inspire the player to want to continue through it. And that's what the game is doing now. So, and the continue option is vital to that, which is, oh, I'm so shocked that Asterix didn't have that. Um, because these games should be persuading you just to keep on playing. Once you've got past level two or three, you should be hooked and you're, the, and you're gonna, and you should be thinking, you know what, I'm gonna keep putting money into this just to see what it throws at me next. But of course, the game has also got to kill the player at the same amount of times. Um, the game's got to make its money. You can't, you should never be allowed to make, get through a game on a single credit. That is, that is the, in the designer's Bible. And which is why, of course, as I said, we have the magic difficulty spikes. Now, I seem to be doing actually quite well at this, but it's only because I have played this a couple of times recently. So I am kind of prepared just for how nasty this can get, which is also why I finished off that boss in short order. Um, but the, the, the concept of big bosses is another gameplay trope that we kind of take for granted and we build entire games like Shadow of the Colossus around. The idea of the boss but the boss was the ultimate difficulty spike that was why it was there it was there so and it was put at the end of the level because it was half carrot half stick you'd reach the end of the, the reaching the end of the level was the carrots to keep the player wanting to go on and see the next stage in the story and see the next level and the boss was the stick to force the player to spend money in order to do that <laughs> Simply put, that is, that is about the size of it. The player must, the, the, the credo was that the player must, for every bit of progression, the player must keep paying. So not only does the player want to keep challenging themselves, the player wants to progress through the story, and yeah now i'm gonna put this now i've returned here i'm just i'm re-recording this after because i've realized at the end of that last clip of our type i forgot to say something quite important because and you, i kind of forgot to do it because i finished off that boss so quickly um as you would have seen the level one boss and i remember that causing a lot of hassle remember when I first saw it um, it's amazing actually how quickly I picked up on this game again I'm still gonna die stupidly a few times but um, it really is one of those games it's very well designed I can see why people have got so are so fond of this I just remember being hellishly um, difficult I had the um, I had the home port of this on the Atari ST I remember um, it was one of the games that came with the, the, the Atari ST power pack. <laughs> and so this boss actually though is a good example. I may not get as far as the end of the level one boss, but yeah, it did wipe me out. But the concept of the boss was like all difficulty spikes, it was as much psychological, we talk a bit, I've spoken a bit about psychology, the psychology of keeping the player putting money into the game but there was another aspect of psychology that is to intimidate the player where they're actually playing and the boss was a perfect means of doing that just by something like the size of the boss now we play through a game and I mean this was back in the days where this was the normal sprite size for a game remember I said about Altered Beast how important it was for that game that the sprites were so huge huge big muscular men beating each other up no <laughs> 
<laughs> um, again, the whole novelty of um, that was a novelty, the, the size of those sprites. And it's kind of the same in this with bosses. The, the, the idea being that the boss, a screen filling boss, wouldn't be something that the player was used to and it would immediately be something that would intimidate that was designed literally to intimidate the player and to shock them shock and awe um, as the as the u.s military is built upon and that's about the size of it literally the size of it oh god no pun intended um that that last boss in our type in the first level of our type and in other other bosses in games literally was that you had a screen filling boss and the first thing the player would think of when they saw it was oh my god how am i going to beat this it was yeah it was it was just designed to actually intimidate and make them lose their concentration so it's another so it's a, yeah you might be thinking oh that's a really sneaky tactic of a, a game designer to do but these these games are get monetization people these games existed to drain money out of your pocket this isn't the home the home console version these see look this is an entire screen filling monster you don't know you're thinking gosh how do i get past it what do i shoot do i shoot the head no that's not working how do i get past that spinning tail and there's a good chance that someone who didn't know what they were doing here would waste a good credit a good few credits in figuring out exactly how to kill that thing now obviously i know how to kill it so I see me do it twice now um but for the new player and with any boss i mean if i I don't think I've ever reached the end of this level in R-Type. I may have done. I certainly can't remember what the boss looks like. So the first time I see that boss, I'm going to be pretty flummoxed. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do? And that was what the idea. It was supposed to be unfair. The first time you saw that boss, like the difficulty spike game mechanics in Donkey Kong, simple as that, it presented the player with a new way of playing the game that they'd never played before and that was deliberate they were sp not supposed to know how to play the game at this point and defeat the boss because it was it behaved unlike anything they'd already encountered simple as that unfair yes but it's a gameplay trope and it's a gameplay trope that has been so ingrained now so ingrained in modern games that we kind of forgotten that it originally existed as a monetization device. Anyway, let's continue with where where I think I left off. <laughs> so I'm returning to Arabian Magic. Why am I returning to Arabian Magic? Because I felt that this was a game with that summed up the power of the, just how important bosses were to coin-op games in getting the player um, to pump that money in. Because Arabian Magic is relatively easy. It is actually it's pretty easy. It's, it's, certainly, it's certainly easier than a lot of the other games of this, of this genre. Uh, it's very little challenge in these opening, with these opening characters. Uh, these opening enemies it's certainly um, yeah the main the main progress through this was pretty easy but as you if you see my video some of the bosses are just they're tanky they're sponges they soak up all your hits and it's extremely difficult if not impossible to dodge all their attacks um Altered Beast had some of that as well. And that's kind of the structure. That is kind of the design ethic of a lot of bosses. They were designed to kill you. Um, they, I mean, at least these days, I suppose. Here you go. The literal difficulty spikes. That was there just to make sure you weren't progressing. And that could kill a new player. Um, so here we go. We've got our first boss. Do you see? Um, it's got a longer reach than you. This was designed to... 
designed to do you damage and to suck the coins out of your pocket. There's no real easy way of, of beating this guy without losing some health and lives. And it's, so that was there at a counterpoint to the, gem, the player's general interest of keeping their way through going through the story. Um, it's a trope that survived into mainstream games, even though games are not... Video games that were coming out after and the home systems that you bought for a hu and you weren't constantly needing to put money into them they kept all these difficulty spikes tropes when actually arguably should those spikes still have been in the game um they were there literally to give an unfair advantage to the computer um in the same way as for example gauntlet 2 which we'll certainly visit at some point in um, introduced the mechanic of the player's life constantly ticking down during that game because they found that actually players could get through most of, hundreds of levels the play testers could get through hundreds of levels without dying simply because there were so many health pickups in the game um, or there were health pickups at all and they'd mastered all the combat to such a degree that they could lose absolute minimal amount of life and so they rigged the game they added that health countdown and we'll go into we're going to explore gauntlet 2 definitely because it is absolutely one of my it's in my top 10 favorite games of all time um but that's it now that mechanic survived into all the home ports as well um should it have done i mean there's no there's no definitive answer to this should bosses still exist in on home on home consoles and home home gaming um arguably yes they do provide an extra challenge and a difficulty and i think it's certainly one of the problems with the home ports of arcade machines though that you only has a limited amount of credits often to play those games but the difficulty remains that these were still games that were impossible to beat without constantly putting in more money so if you played an arcade conversion at home chances are unless you became an absolute master of it you'd never complete it because unlike the coin op version you couldn't keep on buying infinite numbers of credits and, com and continuing And that's kind of about the way I'm going up to at the moment. Um, I think I might call this one a day. But I hope I've given people something to think about there. <laughs> it is, I think it's, it's definitely worth paying attention to the design of these games. And also the fact is that these were the most insidiously monetized video games of all time comparable to the mobile and free to, free to play games of today um, but they became the template for every video game that came after really um, you see much later games I mean let's say Shadow of the Colossus that took that trope of the boss as being the ultimate difficulty spike to frustrate the player and they made a game out of it so every every enemy in that game was a boss and they built a game around it and it certainly they certainly weren't on you can never claim that um, they were unfair enemies they could always be managed so it took the concept of the boss monster but not to the gameplay the impossible gameplay trope of it whereas this as you can see this is here because it immediately throws the... Pl now, I'm sure if I played this about 20 times, I'd learn all the attack patterns and I could dodge them. But the idea is that the player would be in here blind. This is the first and possibly only time they'd ever play this game. And they'd be killed outright by this. And this would cost cost a few quid. <laughs> it would cost at least a couple of credits in order to progress. And I've cast that at the complete the wrong time, and that's why that's why this these bosses exist. Should these tropes be in here? Should suddenly the players be faced by 
unexpected difficulty spikes that exist just to frustrate them. Certainly these things all exist in modern games, but they kind of become accepted. So I think when I carry on through the games, I'm definitely my arcade tour. When I carry on my arcade tour, I'm definitely going to um, just keep an, an eye on the monetization aspect of these games because it's, it's easy to kind of forget that sometimes when we're playing them via an emulator because we are playing them for free now. But before... before we would be very conscious that we were spending money <laughs> and a lot of money in order to play these. And designers certainly by, by this point, absolutely by this point, would have the balance of difficulty down to a kind of a fine art, um, knowing at exactly which point they wanted the player to die and which point they expected the player to start putting more money in. I mean, it wouldn't be the exact science that it is these days, as you can see with mobile games, but that science that we see today with the concept of whales and um, influencing players to... That's whole psychological influencing of players to spend money and to, and to buy microtransactions. This is where it all began. I think it's worth remembering that. It began with the games that form the template of everything that we play today, from Assassin's Creed to, to Cyberpunk. I mean, when was the last time we played a game without massive difficulty spikes or end of level bosses? Funny enough, a lot of the time it could be you could think it's some of the sports games i guess or some of the simplest games we're going back to the games that are closest in spirit to the old arcade shooters like like galaxians you know those games where it simply was you and a few simple rules and that's all the game is But that's, they're going to be kind of few and far between and they're kind of niche because everything else these days, the narrative is the king, as we've seen. that, And that's something that started, as we saw with, um, with Donkey Kong, where with our proto Mario and, and Princess Peach, who became the sort of the quintessential hero and victim and all the antagonists and protagonists that we've seen since then. Anyway, I'm going to see you later. I'm going to sign off now. And I think next time I'm going to get back with the arcade tour and I'm going to do a few more 2.5D fighters. Okay. Take care. See you later.